such a little room. Um, good evening. Uh, many of you I know, but for those of you whom I don't know, my name is Penny Wright, and I work for the Rogers Memorial Library. And on behalf of the library, we'd like to welcome all of you here for this final talking history evening about World War II. Uh, I'd like to begin, as usual, by thanking uh, several people who have helped in various ways to uh, make tonight's program possible. First, our thanks always go to the friends of the Rogers Memorial Library for their uh, generous financial support of all of our programs, even though they do not get paid. <laughs> um, next, uh, we are thankful to Matt Hindra, who is here tonight from LTV, and uh, he will make a videotape and it will be aired on Channel 27 out of Riverhead as well as Channel 27 out of East Hampton. Um, okay. Um, we'd also like to thank Swede Edwards, who's there in the back, for bringing this very large map that, which shows us the whole world and we can refer to it uh, when we need to. And Bill Frankenbach, who's not here tonight, lent us this little recruiting poster. And the guests here tonight have all, have all brought me various memorabilia. We thank you for bringing your memorabilia. Um, and last, we'd like to thank uh, Kathleen Tiska, who was here greeting you as you uh, came in. And we'd like to thank Bernice Holden for making some 1940s-style spam salad. <laughs> Uh, have something to eat. Um, during World War II, uh, roughly 1,000 men and women from the Southampton area served in the armed forces. Uh, of that number, approximately 40 were lost in action. And um, this evening we're going to hear the stories of four survivors, thankfully. And uh, I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, to my right is John Holden, who grew up in Southampton in the family which owned and operated Holden Stationery Store. Many of you remember that store. Yeah, yeah. He graduated from Southampton High School, attended Cornell University, and then enlisted in the Army. We'll hear a little bit about the, the, his years in the Army in a few moments. Uh, but after his discharge from the Army, Mr. Holden returned to Southampton and went to work for Ted Squires, whose office was then on Job's Lane. Eventually, they teamed up to become Squires and Holden, a surveying and engineering firm, from which he officially retired in 1983. And I say officially because you should know that three of tonight's guests are officially retired, but are still very active in overseeing and checking up on their former businesses. Um, Mr. Holden married the former Bernice Lewis, in 1947, and together they raised three children who have now produced four grandchildren for them to enjoy. John Holden has been active over the years in the Presbyterian Church and has served the American Legion overseeing the annual decoration of over 700 veterans' graves with the American flag every year on Veterans Day. He served for a time as the village engineer and also served faithfully on the board of our Rogers Memorial Library for 12 years. We are very grateful to him for being here with us tonight. Please welcome. Okay, next to John is Harry Martin, a somewhat frequent guest on these Talking History programs and a familiar face to many of us here in the village. Harry Martin traces his roots in Southampton back more than a century and like the others, has spent his entire life here except for his time serving in World War II. A 1935 graduate of Southampton High School, Harry Martin began full-time work for Bellows Nursery and stayed there until 1942 when he enlisted in the Army and then rejoined them when he came back after the war. In 1949, he began working for the Gallucci Estate over on uh, Gin Lane. Gin Lane and he was a caretaker there until 1964. 
Although a national member of the VFW since 1945, Mr. Martin is credited with having integrated the Southampton VFW with his membership in 1954. During the years since then, he has been commander for four terms and has served as quartermaster for the past 11 years. And many of you, no doubt, have seen him carrying the American flag annually in the July 4th parade. Many years ago, Harry Martin was one of the first young members of the First Baptist Church on Halsey Avenue in Southampton, and he has remained active there, serving in many capacities, including a trustee and a Sunday school teacher. Mm. Believe it or not. <laughs> 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 He's got to stay on the straight and narrow tonight. <laughs> uh, Mr. Martin is the father of a grown daughter who lives in Richmond, Virginia, and we're very happy to have him with us tonight. Please welcome. <laughs> Harry Martin is another lifelong resident of South Southampton, or should I say North Sea, <laughs> and, <laughs> and his name is, is Bill Mahoney. Mr. Mahoney attended Southampton schools, then took a job working in Meriden, Connecticut for the departure bearing factory. New departure, yeah. New departure. Uh, in November of 1942, he enlisted in the United States Navy and remained in active service until April of 1946, at which point he returned to Southampton and started his own plumbing business, which he ran for 48 years, and which he now checks on daily. <laughs> in 1954, he married the former Irene Babinski, and together they raised five children and have become the proud grandparents of 11 grandchildren. Oh my God. <laughs> Through the years, Bill Mahoney has been very active in the life of this community and has served as chief of the North Sea Fire Department, president of the Southampton Golf Club, uh, and president of the North Sea Community House, among other uh, things. We're very grateful to him for coming here tonight. Please welcome Bill Mahoney. Our last guest next to Bill Mahoney is another lifelong Southampton resident, business owner, and veteran talking history guest, <laughs> Sam Herrick. Uh, Sam Herrick's grandfather, Henry Herrick, uh, Sam's family goes way back in Southampton, a few hundred years, and his grandfather, Henry Herrick, started the Herrick hardware business, which we know and love, in 1865. Um, after graduating from Southampton schools, Mr. Herrick attended Cornell University, then enlisted in the United States Army, where he remained in active duty until 1946. He married the former Constance Edwards in 1943. And I'd like to begin this evening a little bit in the same way that we've begun the other World War II talking history evenings, and that is by just asking you generally uh, if any of you uh, want to comment on this, how much uh, awareness did any of you have of Hitler's movements in, Euro in Europe in the, in the late 1930s? Pretty much aware. Pretty much aware? <laughs> yeah. no, did you? You read it in the papers? No radio, everything. Was it uh, of concern? Well, I think by 1940, most of us figured we were going to get in this thing sooner or later. Mm -hmm. What was the general feeling among people you knew or among yourselves about whether we should or should not be involved? I think most of us felt that we had no choice. We were going to get into this war. A lot of the people on Long Island and Southampton had uh, ties to England, which was being bombed like crazy. Mm -hmm. I remember a situation, I'm sure a lot of the older folks do too, where uh, the mayor of Southampton raised enough money to send an ambulance over to Southampton, England. As to from Southampton, Long Island to Southampton, England. I think exactly. Albert Loning was mayor at that time. Oh, is that so? Yeah. That showed the enthusiasm that we had. Right. Mm -hmm. um, were you aware of any Nazi activities on Long Island, or that there was, you know, that there were people who were having meetings and uh, in support of Hitler? A lot of rumors, a lot of conversations. People would have a pinochle party if they happened to have a German background. They were accused of things. 
uh, no sense naming names, but uh, a lot of our good local, loyal right. American people were accused of doing things that just didn't happen. Just didn't happen. I mean, it wasn't an easy time, I imagine, just to be of German uh, descent. No, it was not. Um, can each of you tell me what, what you were doing on the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed? Can we start with you, uh, John? Just the day itself? Well, I remember it was a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was up in Cornell, and uh, I was in a fraternity house, and the news came on, and uh, it was, you know, everybody was somewhat shocked, although I think we were expecting something to happen any time, and uh, it was a, you know, a, a, just a funny feeling, you know, we're going to be in it now, we knew, mm -hmm. and uh, Sam and I were both together at the time, so we remember the same day, mm -hmm. the same place. Harry, what about you? Where were you that day? Well, that Sunday I was in church teaching the... <laughs> 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 I was in the senior Sunday school class. <laughs> uh, I was assistant to the Sunday school at that time, and that's what I was doing. Uh-huh. And did they not sit in church? No. We found out after. After church? church. How did you find out? Did you go home and listen to the radio? Radio. Or, yeah, radio. The radio. And then the following days when uh, the president came on and told us what was going to happen. Oh, and that? I, oh, sorry. Excuse me. Before that, I mean, every every uh, man from 18 to 28, we registered in uh, October 1941. We had to register at 701. So we figured something was going to happen. Right. And as soon as Pearl Harbor was bombed, they changed the uh, age from 18 to 45. And I met a lot of fellows who were ready to come home at 28 had to go back. Had to go back? Mm -hmm. Had to go back. Okay. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the drafting, the draft board in a minute, but let's ask Bill Mahoney what he was doing on that day. I was out in Connecticut. I was working in this defense plant, and I can remember signs all over the place, an announcement over the loudspeaker, keep your job, don't leave, don't go in service, they've got an expensive selective service system and so forth. But when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, that that made everybody very, very loyal to the cause and the mm -hmm. people were enlisting one after another. Right. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard mentioned in these other couple of evenings that we've had, just the level of patriotism uh, immediately following the bombing was really extraordinary. Is that what you all experienced? Yeah, sure. A lot of resentment. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, they were bombing us now, you know. They weren't bombing right. them, they were bombing right. us. Um, Mr. Herrick, Sam Herrick, could you tell us what you were doing on that day? Well, John's already told you. We were in a fraternity house, and John oh, yeah. and I were roommates at the time. And we heard the news. That was it. Yeah. And we all were. Is everybody right? Um, was there a draft board uh, office here in Southampton? Yes, yes. And yes. where was that office? On Wall Street. On Wall Street. Down on the financial district. Yeah. <laughs> 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 was that before Margaret's rendezvous mm -hmm. was yeah. in there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That was about where it was then. That's where, it was. That's where it was. But Penny, I just want to say that Pearl Harbor Day, I was a young girl. Our big thing on Sunday was walk down to Agawam Park mm -hmm. and walk up and down Main Street, get ice cream going for 10 cents then. Mm -hmm. And we got got home and the radio, because there's no TV in those days, okay. and they said Pearl Harbor. Like, where the heck is Pearl Harbor? You know where the heck is Several people Harbor mentioned about. that last week as Where's well. Pearl, Pearl Harbor really just had no meaning <coughs> right back then to, to most people. But we listened to the radio all night long for right. what was going on. Were people just on the telephone with their friends? I mean, were they out in the streets? What kind of communication was there among people? Was it just, uh, did people go to work the next day? And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You had to, yeah. It was a tough time, not one thing. I um, forgot to mention, uh, yeah. John and I were studying. Did any of you have siblings or 
I, I, it was it was it you, Bill, who had a father who was in World War One? Oh yeah, I had a father who was in World War One. I. I had a, a brother, brother who was a career army man. Yeah. Who so, was later? Who was later killed? Yeah, he was killed in Japan. But that was after the war. After he went on in '39, and he was killed after the war. He stayed in service. Remember him? Um, Harry, do I did I remember correctly that your family had? <coughs> Three brothers in the army for four days. My oldest brother and I went together to Fort Bragg. We slept bed to bed in basic training. The other brother came in four days later. Oh, my. That must have been a hard time for your, for your mother. Well, what could you do? What could you do? Um, we got our greetings, and that was it. Now, um... Um... Now, see, I think I believe that two of you, you deferred for a bit until you finished the school, the school. Sam Harris and John Holden, you finished the school year, yeah. and then, then joined. Yeah, yeah. Harry, you joined fairly soon after. Well, I tell you, we, we went to uh, Grand Central Palace, in New York City, 12th of October, 1942. Gave us 14 days furlough to come home, and 26th day of October. 1942, we... You were there. Headed to which is now uh, Brookhaven, right. Um, Bill, how about you, in relation well, to... Well, I was 18 heart. years old, and I hadn't gotten any notice from the social, from the draft board at all, but uh, I looked around, and I see all the fellows around me, and I was stronger than any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going in the service. So I enlisted in November of 1942. Right, okay. From New Haven, Connecticut. I didn't even come home to Southampton to enlist. You did. Now, I know that all of you went through basic training, and in, in lieu of going down the road and just finding out what, what it was like, I imagine there were some similarities. We were talking about this the other day. What were some of the things... Can you mention some of the things that you all had to do in basic training, what you learned, what kind of exercises you did? <laughs> I remember something about 20 miles high. That's a nice way of learning miles <laughs> We had, I went in the CBs. The CBs were the equivalent of the Navy, of the Army Engineers. CBs were a brand new outfit. Guys came from all over the country. They didn't come from just one section. They were from all over the country. I met a whole bunch of wonderful guys, and we're friends to this day. But uh, we had all of our basic training, all of our running, crawling, racing. We had our 20-mile hikes. We had our we had marine instructors uh, that were giving us all of our training. We had our rifle training. We had our hand grenade training. We had our 20-mile hikes. When we left the states, we were prepared for combat. We were prepared for combat. Yeah. Was the training similar for the rest of you all? The basic training. The basic training. training. Yeah, first. John, I think you mentioned to mm -hmm. me that it was really serious business when you had this training. In fact, one of didn't you have an accident when you were going through basic training and someone? Yeah, they had us uh, go through uh, an infiltration drill. We had to crawl on our stomachs as low as we could, and they had to had some uh, mm -hmm. had. Uh, Somebody shooting, uh, shooting tracer bullets over our heads, you know, about the eight high. And uh, one of them got off a little bit and got one of the guys. And, and killed him? Killed him. Oh, oh, wow. And uh, that was a terrible thing. You know, it was a mistake. They, they, they meant to keep it up high enough, I don't I think, not right. to injure anybody, but they just don't have Did any of the rest of you hear of any accidents, uh, similar accidents? Was this a real freak accident? or? sprained ankles and things like that, right. which was a part of the deal, but nothing serious. No. Nothing serious. Um, I want to start, can we start with you, John, and let's just talk a little bit about the job you did. You, you, uh, we know a little bit about your training. What kind of, uh, let's just hear a little bit about what you did during the war and where you were, and let's show some of the things that you brought. All right. Uh, uh, when I left uh, Fort Belvoir, where I was trained, they sent me up to uh, <clears throat> Northwest Pennsylvania, Shenango, which is a, it was a, an engineer uh, replacement depot, I think. And uh, from there, uh, maybe a couple of months there at the most, they uh, got a group of us together and formed a detachment, I guess they called it, maybe 20 guys, 
and sent us down to um, Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, where we were getting ready to go mm -hmm. overseas. And then uh, I was able to come home from there for a short visit and saw my folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the funny thing about that was I was very uh, conscious of top secret stuff, you know. And uh, so when I left there and I got home, they, they were asking me where I was. I wouldn't tell them where I was. But I, <laughs> on, the, in the, uh, on the post, Fort Hamilton, there was a table of pack of matches said Fort Hamilton. So I took it home. <laughs> I left it there so they knew where I was. But I wouldn't tell them where I was. <laughs> kind of a dumb cat thing. You know? <laughs> but, but you were all fairly you know, young to be, yeah. to be doing this. Did you know that you were going overseas? Yes, as soon as they told you. Yeah, actually, yes, as soon as they sent us to Shenango, I knew we were going to be going okay. overseas sometimes. So. Now, can I just show something that that tells a little bit about what you did, and then you can tell us about it. Um, we've got two maps here. Yeah, these are some of the things the outfit did. We were mapping uh, battalion, and we uh, uh, topographic, 660th topographic engineers was an outfit. And we had three companies. <clears throat> One was a uh, survey company, which I never saw. And then they had a drafting company, which drew the maps. And then a, uh, a reproduction company, which uh, <coughs> printed the maps. And then headquarters company, which is the one I was in, was we edited the maps. Now, what were they maps of? Well, most of, at the beginning when I was there, they were making maps of France. And they were making them piece by piece. I don't know what this one is here. Well, this is a photo map. They made photo maps, and they made maps like our topo maps that you can buy here. Of, uh, quadrangles, you know, like there's a quadrangle for South Sag Harbor, which has mm -hmm. uh, Bridge Champion on it, and then there's another okay. quadrangle. Okay. Now, how did they take these yeah. photographs? Did they have pilots out there? Well, there the, 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 they we fellows that were in the uh, Air Force, mm -hmm. with the RAF and the uh, U.S. Air Force, and, and they flew a mission, or maybe they were out uh, doing recon <laughs> missions too, but whatever mission they were on, they would take pictures of it, and they try to take them so that they could be uh, overlapping the pictures mm -hmm. that they took. And they did a good job because they were able to put these pictures into a machine which uh, the fellows that use this machine were so well trained and so good that they could draw the maps from it and get the heights of the ground and everything, you know, from these, you know. Why were they interested in knowing the topography? Well, these were maps that were going to be used by the troops. So they could shoot from right Yes, right. Oh, I see. That's right. They were So now, when you say you Both edited the maps, what did that consist of? Well, we looked through stereoscopes and checked, uh, generally checked them and made sure that the building they said it looks good. School was a school, not a church, say. Mm -hmm. And so that the landmarks, when they went to look for them on the ground or from the air, I see. would they would uh, be able to be sure what they were. I see. We were fussy, too. We were fussy about this. And so these were well done and very, were they useful? They were. They were used. And uh, uh, they, they told us they, they were good maps. Although they, they were so fussy that they they would never make a final edition. Everything was first edition or something okay. like that. Can you show us anything on this map of, you know, any significance? Well, this happens to be Paris. <laughs> oh, yeah. <is that? laughs> <laughs> Which is a good place to, you know, nice town. And uh, it's the same, yeah. 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 And uh, when we got to France, which was after the invasion, because we were making maps, they put us into a, a printing plant, which uh, shows in the picture. I, I, I can't see it from here, but I think it's up around here somewhere. Mm -hmm. In a little town just outside of Paris. And that's where they had all the uh, machinery and stuff to make the maps. To make the maps. Mm -hmm. um, At that time, after England. Can we just pass this around a little bit, sure. if you don't mind? We'll just keep it a little bit long right here. Um, you mentioned, I remember a couple of things that you were talking about. One was the way that you were welcomed when you arrived in, was it Scotland? Yeah, it was uh, on the Perth of Clyde, and uh, <clears throat> as soon as we got in, in there, they had, you know, coffee and donuts and everything else like that, and uh, 
as we went through the uh, countryside, it was through Scotland, and uh, it was a beautiful day and everything to there. Everybody was waving to us out the windows. There must have been a million troops that went by, you know? Mm -hmm. And here where they were still cheering us on. Just, they were just, it was something. It was, it was really uh, inspiring. You, know? you were first, were you first based in uh, England? That's right. I got there in the Black Hawk. Yeah, you were telling it. Yeah, Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we couldn't see a thing. It took me three three days to find these showers. <laughs> yeah, a few the way along the wall. Right. <laughs> down in the building, you know. And uh, it, it finally, we, did, uh, we got down in town, and the people in the town were wonderful to us. Oh, Thanks, so long you know. Did you socialize with them, or? Well, there wasn't any time there then. Uh, we couldn't uh, meet anybody. It was just a casual acquaintance, like right. we'd gone to a pub, and right. people would be nice to us, and, and that. That was the only time we just right. saw it. Right. Did you were you living in tents at oh, the no, time? No, we had a, a regular building we lived in. Right. Um, now, you were making these maps then in preparation for for D Day. Well, some of it was some that, of them, but most of it was maps of France. So when they got there, they would uh, know where the um, uh, features were they were looking for. You know, right. Going to bomb it or. or or the land forces. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the air raids as you experienced them? Yeah, at the time I got there, it was really after the blitz. Mm -hmm. And there were a few air raids, but not too many until one day we had this air raid and uh, we all went into the shelter. And the, the all clear just didn't go off, you know. We could hear all this. Uh, this noise, you know, planes, and everything up there. You know what was going on. And finally they let us out the next day, and uh, <clears throat> of course the papers didn't say what it was, and finally we found out they were sending over these buzz bombs. Oh. Little, uh, Can you tell us a little bit about buzz bombs? I know that Yeah, uh, they, they were kind of a crude thing, as, uh, you know, to me. They were actually a, a bomb with wings, huh. and they sent it over from some launching pad over in France and aimed it at England. And uh, they, they sent them in a straight line, different directions, you know, more or less toward, all toward London. And uh, when they, every time they sent one over for, for the first time or two, the air raid sign uh, would go off and we'd all go on the shelves. And uh, finally they got the idea, well, we'll have a, a system where it's coming right at us, you know, nearby, they'll ring three bells. So, okay, fine. So they did that, and we watched them go by a bunch of times. Go by over How there. big were they? Well, they looked like a big torpedo, maybe from that door to that door. Oh, oh, and uh, they were uh, black oh, and uh, had wings on them. They looked like a, a torpedo to me with mm -hmm. wings. And <clears throat> they sputtered along. They didn't make, you know, they didn't sound too powerful, but they went along, and uh, some of them would cut out and then go right down like that. And some would cut out and just coast, I don't know how many miles. We used to just sit there and watch them. They didn't worry us because we could see them. <coughs> and one day, one uh, one came along and uh, they rang the three bells and said, okay, there's one coming, you know. So somebody goes, hey, it's coming right at us. You know? <laughs> and everybody died where they could under the beds or anything else, you know. And some fellows made it to the shelters. And the thing hit our place and it landed where the the guard room was, and they killed the officer of the day. And uh, one of the, one of the men was in the chow line down in the, in the mess hall, and a pipe came loose in the bomb, and landed on him and killed him. So we had two casualties from that. Mm -hmm. A few injuries, but uh, we kind of wrecked the place. But uh, it was a big building, so we just moved into another part of the building. Right. Okay. Now, I think you were talking about after the the buzz bombs. They began with the V-2 rockets? Yeah, that was something. And what were they like? Well, they were scary because you couldn't see them. <laughs> and you, did, you didn't have the same kind of warning, right? Uh, no warning, no, because they, they just came out of the stratosphere, kind of way up. And uh, the first time we heard one, this explosion, we didn't know what it was. So it belonged to a gas main. But then again, we heard another one, another night, 
you must be a flying gas mate. <laughs> <laughs> because if you, we could see some of the damage. You know, okay. Some of the fellows went over the hell out. And uh, after that, uh, there was nothing you could do. Being in the shelter wouldn't protect you. Because when those babies hit, they would blow everything out, you know. With the buzz bomb, it would laterally, and if you're in the shelter, you're protected. So we just sweated them out. And, uh, fortunately, the troops found where they were launching them and, and, and captured them. So they How long did they go on? Well, let's see, I think it probably, maybe a month or so, it seemed to me. The buzz bombs were a little longer. The buzz bombs were maybe three to, three to four months. Mm -hmm. During this time, did any of it begin to feel routine? I mean, were, were you fearful after these uh, B-2 rockets started up? I mean, did you go to bed and wonder if you could wake up the next day? Or? Sure did. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was scary. Mm -hmm. You didn't know where it was going to land. Right. The bug bombs were the sea. You know, so mm -hmm. they just, they're going over there. We, we felt bad with the, for the people that were landed on, but, right. but they, they didn't hit us. During <clears throat> during this time, did you have time off? Oh yes, sure. We had and what would you do on your time off? Well, was the time to go to the pub? Try to forget a little bit. Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were plenty of pubs around. Yeah. Learn more about the different kind of beer. Did you write letters? Yes, sure. Did. Sure. Receive letters? <laughs> yeah. And you weren't married to Bernice at the time, were you? No, hadn't married. Well, I knew who she was, but I right. uh, <laughs> struck on her acquaintance. Right. <laughs> but uh, several people have mentioned to me how much receiving mail meant to them back then. It sure did. Anybody can attest on that, I think. Mm -hmm. It was great to get by this mail. Anything else, it maybe a cookie or something once in a while was nice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> got to you. The other guys didn't get it first. <laughs> What kinds of uh, rations or food? I mean, you actually may have, I think the rest of these guys really lived in tents a bit more than you did. I'm sure they did. Yeah. Um, so what kind of food did you have? Well, it was, it was good food. Nothing wrong with it. It was good food. Yeah. Yeah, it was good food. Did the Army supply you with alcohol or tobacco or anything like that? Well, you know, he actually buy uh, cigarettes. So, okay, you were in England and then you went over yeah, to, to France, to yeah. France after it was liberated? Yeah, it was after Paris was liberated. And then how long, did you, and then what did you do after Paris? <coughs> well, after, after, well, for a while there we made maps, uh, still making maps because it was so up in the front there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were moving so fast, the pattern was moving so fast that they couldn't keep up with, with the maps. So they uh, they sent back captured German maps, and we just, and the guys uh, reprinted them, uh, 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 and sent them back up in, in English and French, mm -hmm. as well as German. Mm -hmm. The German maps were all in German. They translated them and, uh, and reproduced them in, in color. These things were in like three or four colors. Mm. Um, then, how did, where were you when the, when, uh, Hitler, you know, gave was up. defeated, when he gave up? I was in, I was in, in Paris. Paris? Yeah. <clears throat> and what was the mood like? Oh, it was a lot of celebrating. It was just, yeah, it was a big, uh, a big time there. Uh, it was an exciting time. Yeah, I bet it was. Mm -hmm. How did, there were people out in the streets, or? Oh, yeah, they were all over the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, from then, um, you were still in the service for a while. You were still over there for a while, were you not? Yeah, I was over there until um, early 46. Early 46. So you were there six months after? Yeah. Or more? Yeah, more than that. More than that? Yeah. Uh, and what were you doing during that time? Well, after, uh, after the war, we had a way to get home, right? <laughs> <laughs> you had to get so many points. Of course, uh, the fellas that were out on the front got more points, so they, they were able to go home sooner, of course, and they, and they deserved to. But uh, uh, what we did, we just 
hung around and uh, just did whatever we could do to while away the time. You were still officially on duty. Oh yeah, we, were, we, were, we made a, a booklet or something at the company. Yeah, I think. <laughs> something like that, just yeah. a little memento. And then uh, came a time when they started to break us up more, and uh, they sent me up to uh, Germany until I got enough time in to come home. And what was that like for you going to Germany? Well, we got into a, uh, uh, an outfit just like the one we were in. Another company that happened to be stationed up there after the after the uh, uh, after the war was over, and they was they were doing things much like we were doing. Well, they were kind of waiting around too to go home. So while I was, while I was there, I was able to uh, take a, a weekend pass, and was, this was in Munich where I was, and go down into Garmisch Partenkirchen, which is a resort area there. Golly sakes, you could you was, they were it was great, you know. They had a hotel there, you could go down there and mm -hmm. stay in the hotel, take, go skiing, whatever. But I mean, I can't there. imagine wanting to vacation in a, in a country that you've just been feeling so much animosity toward. But was there not that feeling? I mean, was it odd? Did they receive you well in Germany? Yeah, they, they were okay, the ones like people I spoke to. Uh, well, I didn't get, I didn't feel uh, like I wanted to be too, uh, friendly with them. Yeah. But I wasn't there long enough really to... Were you with other American soldiers? Yeah. It was an yeah. outfit, something like we were in. Right. And, uh, that, that's what we did. One of the things that we were chatting about the other day, and I think you had a couple memories, was that during the war, many entertainers, American entertainers, uh, sang for the troops and performed for the troops. Yeah, there were a lot of good ones. And they were all good. And, and Do any of you remember? Uh, I don't know. Bob came over. Oh, yeah, he was good. Where was that? Was that in Paris? That, that was in Paris, yeah. And he was he was funny as a dick as he was. I had a three day leave in Paris and uh, walked into this big theater, it's a USO show, and Clint Miller was playing a Moonlight Serenade. Uh, and uh, that was great. it really <laughs> kind of brought tears to my eyes. Yeah. At, uh, was it right after that he was killed? In yeah. From, I think it was when he left there. Mm -hmm. Flying through somewhere. Mm -hmm. How about you, Bill? We had no entertainers come over there uh, where we were. We did have movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one night we was on an island by the name of Donga. We had built an airstrip on that island. There was army boys there and there were marines there. But the marines had sheared off a cliff and made a screen out of a coral wall. <laughs> and uh, we were there watching movies. In the middle of the movies, we heard the siren go off. That means an air raid. So all the lights went out, completely dark, and we all crawled underneath whatever we could, a rock, a, a machine, a car, whatever. Nobody got hurt, but when the air raid was over, they didn't put the movie back on again. On the way back to my camp, feeling my way through the woods, for some reason or other, and I'll never know why, I hollered out, anybody here from Long Island? <laughs> and I hear this voice, yeah, I'm from Long Island, Southampton. Oh. <laughs> and I walk over, and here underneath, in the tent, with a mosquito net over the top of them, was Bill Gaines. Oh, now, Bill God. Gaines had gone into the CBs. Uh, most of the CBs were older people. I was still in my teens, but most of the CBs had a background in some trades or heavy equipment or bulldozers or something like that. But there was Bill, and uh, we had a great reunion. And just to compound the thing, I was working on a fuel oil truck one night on the airstrip. Planes came in from a mission. You know, all the missions were in fighting missions. They were observations. They were just keeping tabs on things. And I suppose I was too far out onto the airstrip, but the pilot of this one plane landed, come out, and he headed over toward me as if he was going to give me a hard time. And it turned out to be Andy Jagger. That's Cyrus Jagger. Andy Jagger from Southampton, and he had quite a history in the war. And I met him once or twice after the war. But between Bill Gaines, who had worked at Shinnecock Golf Links as a caddy master many years before, ended up working for Booley after the war and as an electrician. But Andy and Bill and I got together and we 
walk through the chow lines, eating our atabrim and so forth, <laughs> eating whatever the food they would give us. But Andy was in a better position than we were. He was a pilot. He was an officer. He got us a bottle of old Angus scotch. <laughs> Never heard of it before or since, but I know the three of us went down by the shore and we sat there and we nibbled on it and I didn't like scotch. I don't think any of us did, but we got silly enough talking and laughing. Mm -hmm. But it, it's great how you could run into two guys from home Isn't that on a little island. Ondonga was an island that was uninhabited. Uh, after we had left Guadalcanal, we moved up to Andanga to build an airstrip. And these little islands were stepping stones as the war moved closer to Japan. And uh, they weren't people on the island. They were uninhabited. They were what I do remember is uh, on some of the coconut trees was a uh, palm olive sign. Apparently that company had planted coconut trees out there in the year going back. All bulldozers went in there and just pushed them down and lowered oh. them and flattened them. And that's the way it had to be. I wonder if we could just ask you, Bill, a minute. Um, should we refer to the map a little bit? I want. Can you tell us where you were? Can you walk over there. I can now. I can We sailed from Port Wainimi, California, on the UMS Island Mail, which was a converted freighter. It used to be a freighter. They made it into a troop ship. And 18 days we zigzagged across the ocean until we got to New Maya, New Caledonia, which is right here. It was a French island. But it was from there that we got on LSTs, which were the landing ship transports with the big gate that flopped down on the front. From there we went up to Guadalcanal. And those islands are right in here below New Guinea where Harry was. If I'd known he was there, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> but our outfit worked on the airstrip at Henderson Field with Guadalcanal. And uh, when I say worked on it, it was very mushy, muddy land there. We had to build that airstrip. Uh, we didn't build the airstrip, but we worked on the airstrip. They had to put down what they called Pierce Plank, and it was interlocking steel planks, which they laid on the ground. And then we would bring coral in, plow it over the top, and smooth it out. And that formed the airstrip. And a lot of times when they had air raids, and they did, it was almost a daily occurrence for a long while there, they would bomb the airstrip and make an awful mess of these pierced planking. And somehow or other, our CV outfits had to get in there and get that field leveled off so that the planes could operate the next day. But from Guadalcanal, we went up to this little island of Ondonga, which I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. Then we went up to Sterling Island and the right. Treasury Group. And where's that? They're all in this chain. The, uh, the Solomon Islands with Guadalcanal, and we went up to the New Georgia Islands, which was Munda, uh, Kalamangara, and the island of Ondonga, where we worked. And then we went up to the Treasury Islands, uh, which was another little group of islands. There was another airstrip that we built there. Everybody was worried about Rabaul at that time. Rabaul was a big island where the Japs were strongly fortified. And everybody was in dread of having to go into Rabaul. As it turned out, they never did take that island. They circled around it, they isolated it, and the war, it, it, during the war, they never did take Rabaul. Mm -hmm. We ended up on Okinawa. Mm -hmm. But it's all in here above Australia, all these little islands, all little stepping stones. What kind of living conditions did you have down there? We lived in tents. Mm -hmm. We went ashore, we went over the side of the ship on a cargo net with a full pack and we had a rifle. And when I hear about the rifles today, I'm amazed. We had a Springfield 03. <laughs> but it was a powerful rifle, but it wasn't a, a fast repeater or something. But uh, we lived in tents. And what I remember about the war was that it was work. You know, John will tell you all the work that they had to do. All the work was construction. The hand-to-hand -hand combat that you used to hear about in the, in the old days, it, it really wasn't there. We were fighting from a distance. We were, when we went ashore, our main concern was clearing an area for a little uh, first aid room. We had a clearing area for, uh, for food and for our own tents. We lived in tents. Uh, alongside of the tent, we'd dig a big foxhole there about five men could go down in that thing. And whenever an air raid came over, it would have had to be a direct hit to get us because there were coconut logs across the top. There was coral power all over the top of it. And we had a beer bottle full of diesel oil and a rope in it. We'd light that with a match, and that was our candle. But we'd spend sometimes 45 minutes down in there. 
but we could get to it in a hurry. When we heard the siren, our job was construction, so we had to get out of the way, and we did. About how long did you have as a warning? Well, when the siren went off, you could count on a bomber coming over within certainly 10 minutes. And I can still hear that non-syncopated drone of the Japanese motors. And there were motors in those days, no jets. Mm -hmm. uh, people like uh, Andy Jagger, which I'll tell you about, he flew an F4U Corsair. That was a Navy fighter plane. And the Australians had the P-39 Air Cobras with the tricycle landing gear. They flew mostly escort duty because they were more disciplined. They'd stay with their planes. They wouldn't go shooting off mm -hmm. like the Americans were out today. I see. But it was... Uh, it was pretty, uh, you were on edge all the time. You were on edge. It was, uh, it was probably really hot down there, wasn't it? I think it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> and mosquitoes, did you have mosquito netting? Was it just? Every tent had a mosquito netting. Yes, right. And how many men slept in a tent? Eight. Eight. Were there any women on any of these islands that you're talking about? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> plane would land uh, and there would be a nurse on there who would just get out of the plane for a few minutes. God, we'd all stand there and look at the moon. And, and, and there were no, no ladies. How many casualties did you all have in your, you know, in your group? Well, fortunately, we didn't have a lot of casualties. Uh, John was talking about the, the bombs, the buzz bombs. Japanese use what we name personnel bombs. They were like a small torpedo, maybe the size of this lamp, but they had about a five foot rod on the nose of them. And when the nose hit the ground, they would burst above the ground. We call it a personnel bomb. And, and a lot of the guys got nicked from shrapnel and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as a lot of casualties, we were very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, those foxholes were great. Yeah. Nobody stood up there singing the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. Yeah. Coming over. You know. right. um, well, did you have uh, corpsmen, doctors? Oh, absolutely. Before I left the outfit to come home, I had to have my teeth fixed. We had a corpsman pumping while the dentist grew my teeth. Uh, and I was hoping he wouldn't get tired. <laughs> <laughs> Now, at the point at which you're talking about, was Japan still sort of ahead? Was it, you were in... In the early days, like on Guadalcanal, as we were moving up, yes, the Japanese had more power out there than we did. Mm -hmm. But by the time we got up to Bougainville, and then they went on up into Iwo Jima, and uh, some of the other bigger islands, we had it under control. We were, you know, it was, it was an aircraft war. The aircraft would go in, they would soften up the islands. Then the Marines and the Army would go in with the CVs right behind them. And we had to stay there and take whatever retaliation there was. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can remember just working, working, how imminent it was to get the land cleared, to get that airstrip in operating condition. Mm -hmm. When you talk about coral, do you mean crushed up coral? or? It was like, well, you could scoop it up like you do sand. Oh, We'd go out oh. by the edge of the lagoon, scoop it up, load it on the back of a dump truck, and bring it out onto the airstrip. Oh. And our guys got to the point where they could drive away from the load with it while they were tilting the, the body up and mm -hmm. just spread it right along. And we had to grade it, level it, pound it, and maintain it. Was it hard, a hard surface when it was uh, After it was pounded down? down, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can you sit <laughs> I have forgotten a lot of this stuff. Ever since you approached me, I've been losing a lot of sleep. You think about right. that. <laughs> now, did, did the mail reach you over there where you were? Absolutely. Sometimes uh, it would come in a bunch and you'd get two weeks mail all at once. Mm -hmm. It wasn't any regular delivery, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we did get our mail. And wrote letters home? Absolutely. Um, how long were you over in this general area of the world? Year. Now, then they sent me back to the States. Mm -hmm. Like I say, I was one of the young kids, and uh, I was lucky enough to get picked to go to officer training school, which was a Navy V-12 program. Mm -hmm. They sent me back to the States, and I went to the University of Rochester. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there for a semester until the war in Germany was over. 
Then they gave us our choice of staying in, signing up for another couple of years, or going back to service and getting discharged, which I chose to do. Mm -hmm. So then they ended up putting me on a minesweeper, and I ended up on the, I ended up the war in Panama City, Florida, on a minesweeper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when were you discharged then? April the 11th, 1946. 1946. <laughs> I remember the day. <laughs> um, why don't you show us the Russian helmet? Uh, is that your very own? Helmet? Yeah, that has a helmet lying underneath it and a steel helmet on top. That was part of your gear. Your gear consisted of a backpack, your rifle. We had our little Eaton kettle, didn't we, Harry? Yeah. You had a little canteen. Uh, you had, to wear the, you had to wear the helmet, uh, that was just precautions, mm -hmm. and it got to be awful heavy after a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, during the day when you were doing your work, you all had your helmets on? Okay. Yeah, what you wore, you took the steel one off, there's a, there's a light or liner on it. Mm -hmm. We had time on our hands, once the armor was secured, we'd hang around doing little or nothing. And this is an example, this is a Japanese shell that I picked up. Mm. Sawed it off. And we filed it with a three-corner, with a little drill and a three-corner file. We made an ashtray out of it. Why don't you hold it up so people can see it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my 82nd Sydney battalion. But I spent hours and hours doing that. And uh, I don't know, I had it on the desk in my shop for years and nobody even looked at the desk. <laughs> Did you actually use it as an ashtray? Was it used as an ashtray? No, no. We, we made it as a souvenir. To you made it, yeah. Yeah. It has been used since then as an ashtray. Right. <laughs> and speaking of cigarettes, we used to get a GI issue. It was in a planter's peanut can with a band around it said U.S. a government issue, and there were cigarettes. And they gave them to us for nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, guys would light them, smoke a couple of drags and throw them away and just burn up more. And by the way, there were no pubs in the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do remember the first couple of days when we landed on an island, uh, and Harry knows this, your backpack had a, a shelter head in it. You needed two guys to put what you would call a pup tent together, because for the first couple of nights you slept wherever you could, mm -hmm. however you could. Mm -hmm. and you had to have, you had to be buddies. You, you know, no, yeah. no antagonism, no favors, no nothing. Right. You were looking for a friend. <clears throat> I was listening to something the other night about the war, and it just it was emphasizing how quickly we became close to and trusted, and particularly, I guess, when people were in active combat. But the relationships that you formed were really strong. We've had a Navy reunion every year since 1947. Uh, we have a reunion each year in a city where one of our members lives, and we moved it all around the country. Uh, guess who got the job of writing the newsletter and keeping the addresses up to date? Yeah. Oh, great. It's been, it's been great, and to this day, my wife and I, and for many years, my kids went to Navy reunions, and, and it's, it's just been wonderful. That's great. Gee, this is 50 years later. That's pretty amazing. Um, oh, 56 years. Um, I didn't realize that we're, we don't have too much, we have some time left, but let's move on to, uh, let's ask Harry, uh, Harry, just, I want to just ask you what, what it was like to be in a segregated army. Well, I'll tell you, we left here to go to uh, Camp Upton. That's where they split us. I mean, to have been born in South Hampton, to have gone to school in South Hampton, I had friends in South Hampton. We left here, we got to Upton, they said, okay, 25 over here, 26 over here. And from then on, I was in a segregated army. Mm -hmm. I never served in any outfit. Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, where I first got my basic training, I went to Fort Bragg. And my oldest brother and I used to sleep bed to bed. But our basic didn't last very long. We got there the third of October '42, and uh, the sixth of December, 1942, we were transferred from 
the gun battery, which is a 155B battery, to a specialist battery. That battery he taught cooks, clerks, general mechanic, gun mechanic, instrument survey men, radio men, clerks. Now, my brother, he went into the motor pool section. And of course I, since I had typewriting, shorthand, bookkeeping, South Ham High School, I went down to the clerk section. I was in the clerk section about a week, and the uh, first sergeant came one, one day and said, the public commander wants to see you. I said, okay. Everybody started laughing at me. Take your leggings off. You just had way to wear leggings. I took my leggings off. I put them in the locker. I went down. Knocked on the door. The public commander says, come in. I said, well, I'll tell you what. He says, the uh, company clerk is going on two week furlough. And we want you to stay down here with him and learn uh, about the orderly room. About the? Orderly room. That's, that's just like the office. Right. So I come by. So morning report, duty roster, sick book, this thing, that thing, the other thing. And I stayed down there for two weeks. But when he came back, I took off and went back to class. I hadn't been in class 15 minutes before I wanted me down the only room. Can I go down there? So I, from now on, you stay here. He's going to uh, be reduced in grade and uh, going out with the, with the uh, group. That's how I started getting a company clerk. 242 men, when they came in, and you should shift them in, you know, little by little, and you had to make a, a roster. Alphabetized roster, strictly alphabetic, all the serial numbers, the names, all that. You had to do all that. But I did that for, uh, oh, maybe three, four months. The next thing I knew, uh, they made me a corporal when I first started. Next thing they did, they made me a buck side. Okay, I'm a buck side. <laughs> next thing I knew, we got. They want to close. Well, this is this is Fort Bragg. There are there are five regiments. They're going to close the uh, fifth regiment, 14th, 15th, and 16th battalion. The 16th battalion was the only black battalion. There, that that was the 16th. It was the last one. The first one you get when you come from Fayetteville is the 16th. Now we had all white officers, every single one. And I never, I'm not bragging. I never served under the white walks in the army and had an IQ as high as mine. Now, how's that? <laughs> well, that's right. I never served on an officer in the army and had an IQ as high as mine. When I went into the service in the camp up and we took the army general classification test, I got 145 out of 165. They wanted me to go to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for field artillery and I didn't want it. That's why I stayed in Bragg. I left, left Fort Bragg went out to California. <coughs> there were six six men that went out from uh, Fort Bragg to California from high outfit. The first sergeant, tech sergeant, a couple of stairs. There were six of us. What they did was they hooked us to the back of a, a train <coughs> and swung us into New York City. Then we left us there for a while. We got another train. Then we started to try. We didn't know where we were going. They didn't tell us where we were going at all. We were just riding. Kept on going, 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 going. That's when we got to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So they pulled in the siding at night and couldn't get off. Next morning, he got in. Okay, everybody, put your fatigues on. Put your fatigue hats on. Grab your bag. And get off. And who do I meet? The, four, uh, the field artillery replaced from band. And uh, Lonnie Green from Bridgehampton. He was playing that band. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, here we go. But I stayed in Fort Bragg for 13 months. Then we left Fort Bragg and went out, out to, on our way out to California. We stopped in Little Rock, Arkansas first. The next time we stopped was Texarkana. Texarkana, that's between Little Rock and Texas. Rock. The uh, station is split. You get off here in Arkansas, you get off there in Texas. I remember six of us got off the train in Arkansas. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was going far along with a shotgun. I said, Margaret, let me tell you what train. You said, we don't allow no niggas to get off here. So you get back on a train and get off in Texas. You don't know what it, what it is. And that's exactly what he said. And every time I, 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 see, I see the president talking about Arkansas, I think, I think about that. 
and about took out double bags and I'm not at about two o'clock in the morning. And the water was running, I mean, laying out, running right over my chest, just like that. So get up, take everything out of your bag, put it on the bushes, and the, the sun would come out and dry it out. And we used to watch over the old standing rain. You could hear it, hear the rain coming, and we'd just run out there and get wet, and about 10 minutes later, the sun would come out. And it up. That, that's what happened. But the out, outfit I had over there was a, uh, an ordnance ammunition outfit. Now, all we did was receive store and ship ammunition. That was our job. We're in order to store and ship. store and ship ammunition. We were doing around the clock bombing of Japan. That, we were showing it up. We were showing it up there. And I'll never forget, the 690s was there in our area. They used to eat with us. And when they got ready to go up, hit the Philippines, they took them ahead of us because they'd been overseas. And don't you know, every one of those men got killed. Jack, yeah. wow. Jack bombed the, the ship as we were going into the port, blew him, every one of them away. Mm -hmm. well, that, that happened to them. Well, we missed that. But uh, <coughs> leaving, leaving, uh, oh, I stayed in Oro Bay, New Guinea, 13 months. I'll tell you that's the longest state. Harry, um, show you a little, I mean, let me just say something. We got to move on pretty soon because yeah. we need to have time for Mr. Good. Harris. But, Show, show everyone your little diary that you have. Can oh, you do that? <laughs> First of all, this is, there's Harry, right there. Oh, handsome devil. Yeah, handsome devil. Yeah. You're not supposed to read that. That's what you See, Harry kept a diary, it was called My Life in the Service, and he wrote in it faithfully. And Harry, Harry, tell the people here about them editing your diary, and then they cut out some pages. There was something that happened down there. Okay, look, let me just ask you one other thing, Harry, because we have to move on. I want you to just... Uh, you were you were moving on to Japan then, right? Well, we, we moved up to the Philippines first. Yeah, you moved to the Philippines. But well, we got to fast forward to the Philippines. Okay, you were in the Philippines. When How long were you in the Philippines? Well, we only went to the Philippines. We were on the island of uh, Panay, Itolila. We were taking a serious training for the invasion of Japan. I don't know where you okay. were going on the boat going around and around. The invasion of Japan was supposed to spend November 1st, 1945. That's when it was. Right. When you want to set it up. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to set up an ammunition depot on the southern part of uh, Japan, and then the trips were moved in. Mm -hmm. But uh, the war got over. Yeah. And then, the next thing we had to do was get ready to go to Japan. 77 ship convoy, LSTs, that's what we had going on. In 31 days, it took us from Philippine Islands to Japan, we got caught in, Ico in the typhoon of Okinawa, oh, four days, like that. We get into, the, into Yokohama, there were so many ships, we had to sail up the uh, right-hand side of uh, Japan, through the Strait of Hokkaido, come back down to New Niagara. The New York 27th Division was due to go come home December 1st, 19, 1945. My got a movement order, November 30th, 45. That's how, that's what happened to us. We moved from the garden to Zushi. Mm -hmm. And that's all we were doing there, was going up in the mountains and closing up. The Japs had hauled the mountains out, and they had like you, just like that, where you shoot fire here, fire there. We had to go up and blow all that up. Mm -hmm. And they, if you hadn't <coughs> invaded Japan, you'd been in trouble, because you'd have to go down through mountains. Right. And they always had everything ready for you. Mm -hmm. But, uh, Harry, did you say that your outfit was the first black outfit? The first black that ever hit that area of Japan. That ever was in that area. The kids were doing like that. Nobody knows what we went through. Right. Nobody knows what we went through. Yes. Not yes. just being in the war, but this whole other experience That's that you right. have not experienced here in South Africa. That's true. Harry, uh, just tell us about meeting someone from South Africa on the way back. Oh yeah, we were in, uh, in uh, Zama, Japan. That's where the fourth replacement is. That's where you go when you leave your outfit. So I left my outfit in January of uh, January 8th, 1945, to go to Zama. And uh, 
You go in, you got a stack of paper. They're patient when you put them underneath, and they give you, you got to watch the bulletin board, because you only stay there three days. So after those three days, you go down, we went to Yokohama, we got on a, get on a train. They, they separate you. Anybody was going to New York, the Fort Dix, the Fort Martin, New Jersey, they had them there. So, I heard you one fellow say, I'm going to Sag Harbor. Another <laughs> says, I'm going to Bridge Hampton. So I walk back there to see who they are. And the first one is Dan Mulvey. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Whose sister was one of the nurses yeah. on the nurse program. You know, Zabrowski. That's, that's it. The next one was uh, a school teacher, Rich Hampton. His name was Mike McKeon. He came from Ty Ticonderoga. So we came, you know, we all came back. Everybody from New York and New Jersey. <clears throat> they were in the same area. You got on a ship. USS Moore Mac Wren. That was it. <laughs> a cargo ship where they brought Japanese prisoners back and then they brought us home. It took us 16 days to get to Santa Barbara, California. We got into the States on the 25th day of January. 28th, we flew out of uh, Wilmington, California, the air base, Newark. 85 in California, 9 degrees above zero right here. <laughs> <laughs> now we were right out of, you know, it was cool. So, uh, Within, uh, I got you on the 28th, the 31st day of January, 1946, I made my last GI formation. They tried to get me to come back into service. I was the first time. No way. I can't imagine that people would want to do that. I had spent enough time away from here. I was just glad to get back into service. That, that was it. That's it. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harry. Don't we all wish we had a memory That's like Harry Martin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Sam Harris, can we can we go on to you? Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of training you had for what kind of job you were going to do? Well, unlike everybody else, I, I was drafted from here. I got the deferred draft because I graduated from college for right. June of 42. I went to Camp Upton and from there to Fort Knox where I took basic training in armored division. And, uh, Pretty hot. Did a lot of walking. Did a lot of riding in the damn tanks. So. <laughs> and uh, then uh, I was there for two sessions because they made me a cadre for the train and next group that came in. And then I applied to <coughs> officers candidate school in, in the artillery and went to Fort Sill, went through OCS, came out of there. And, Sent me to California, and uh, while I was in California, I sent Constance, and we were married out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we went up to Camp Beale, which is up north of Sacramento, North Marysville. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, three battalions of artillery to train and get ready to go overseas. We didn't know where we want to go. And uh, they were putting their year. When you say there, you In Marysville, California. Oh, I see. And uh, I got orders to get on the train, <laughs> and load up the whole outfit. We didn't know where we were going. We ended up in Boston. They took us to Louisville. And we went down from Liverpool to Chepstow, around Bristol Bay, mm -hmm. and from there to Normandy, about uh, 10 days after the invasion here, and then we went south of Paris and did a lot of <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your kinds of, your art, the artillery that you were involved with? Uh, can you tell us about the... Well, we had 155 long tons, they were called, and uh, they would fire a shell. Now these were cannons, were they? <coughs> uh, well, I guess you'd call them cannons. Sort of like cannons? Sure. Yeah. yeah, they were guns. <laughs> yeah. Right. But they were they were big, right? They were big, yeah. They were big. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot bigger than this room. <laughs> 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 so that's a so that six inch. Yeah, it's a six inch shell. Yeah. About that big around. How long was it? Well, it was about that long, and they were fired with uh, powder in them. Put the shell in the barrel, and then you put the powder in and it's in behind the breech, and close the breech, and, and the way the shell would go, hopefully where you were aiming it. 
Now, these were huge, since these were huge uh, weapons, how were they moved? Well, when we did our training in the States here, we had big six by six trucks, that's six by six wheels. Diamond T's they were. Diamond T's they were. But when we got to England, they issued us big cats, caterpillar okay. tractor type of thing. That would Tremendous things. They were biggest. Well, they may not have been as long, but they were higher than this from <coughs> And uh, so we had to train with those in England for a couple of weeks, and there were a lot of English hedges that got knocked over. <laughs> and uh, then they sent us into Normandy after the invasion. So you, you went over to Normandy and you had this, you were in a battalion? I was in a battalion. And oh. how many guns were in a battalion? Of those guns? I, I'm trying to remember that, really. I think we had four guns. <laughs> and how many men were used to Normal man Normal battery and artillery is four guns per, per battery. Right. Uh, but with the long times it wasn't as many guns. And uh, what was the question? How many men were used to operate and maintain these? Well, you had equipment? about 30 men per gun. 30 men per gun. Oh. And so what were the various things that these people did, with all these 30 people did? We tried putting one of those things in place and go, no. <laughs> <laughs> and with Patton's army, it wasn't once a day, it was three or four times a day if you were lucky. <laughs> You would be shooting them? Yes. Uh, putting them in position. Moving, moving, moving. 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 And resetting them up. How did you know, how did the person who was figuring out where to aim it know where to aim it? Well, we had uh, observers. We had maps. <laughs> <laughs> and we had, uh, in the headquarters battalion, they had uh, a group of people who were uh, 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 telling them where to where to aim them, what to do. Right. And then we had observers. If you had a handy hill, it would be somebody would have to go up there and watch where the shell went and tell them to go right, left, or on this azimuth. Uh, so, it sounded like you were fairly near the, the enemy. You were far away. Oh, yeah. You were Sometimes you had this point blank fire But, uh, I mean, how far away were you to the people you were aiming at? Well, normally it would be maybe three or four miles. Three or four miles. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was somebody shooting back at you? And that's a long procedure across France, Germany, all the way to Czechoslovakia. Uh, one time we were in France, and uh, down the road comes this truck with the frogs. We call it the French. Everybody called the French people frogs in them. <laughs> Here comes these two guys driving this truck, going like a bat out of hell. And we know the Germans are just over the next hill. And uh, they turned over right by where our guns were placed. And it turned out to be a truckload of brandy. <laughs> and uh, the colonel, uh, the commanding officer, uh, Colonel, he, uh, he confiscated the whole thing. <laughs> and then he passed it out to uh, his time by five. <laughs> the race guys were in a hurry to get out of there, and they wanted their guns. <laughs> Another time we went over, maybe you remember reading or hearing about the Remagen Bridgehead, which went across the, the Rhine at Mainz. Uh, it was thrown up quickly by the Army engineers, and uh, one of the outfits that went across there just before they went across had liberated a whole a big warehouse full of champagne. <laughs> every truck, every vehicle that went across the, that bridge got a case of champagne. <laughs> Have you ever tried drinking champagne out of the bottle? <laughs> 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 
You were talking about the USO shows and whatnot. A place called Nancy France. They had a USO show with Marlene and Dietrich. Oh. Uh, go see what the boys in the back room were like. <laughs> Anyhow, that was a great show. But uh, we survived. We, we, went up to, we were called up to the Battle of the Bulge and uh, put that down. <laughs> so you were really constantly on the move by virtue of what you were doing? Pretty much, yes. Living in tents, or did you sleep out in the open? Or? Well, if the weather permitted, but it was right. pretty damn cold. It yeah. was the middle of winter. That's the coldest time I ever had in my life. Going from, we were in uh, Luxembourg, and we went up to the Battle of Bulls, and it was a midnight ride. And of course, no lights. Didn't know where the heck we were going, really. And uh, open jeep. And, <laughs> and then we had an awful lot of mud to get them with too. <laughs> but when you get those guns bunked down in the mud, you have problems. <laughs> now, did you have mail coming to you? Yeah, we had. Yeah, mail. Now, where were you when you when you found out that you had a son? Mm -hmm. You've been born. I was uh, in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. huh? What what must that have been like? That was muddy. <laughs> <laughs> We're really running out of time, so let me just ask you all. Um, Bill Mahoney talked about how much keeping in touch with your army buddies, that's our navy buddies, has meant to you all. Uh, has it been pretty much the same for for all of you? Oh, yes, you, John, right? I want to talk with uh, the point of saying the man, when I first went down the court right in the first section, the instructor there, his name was Harold Mancini. And he came from Lockport, New York. And uh, he lives in Fayetteville now. He married a school teacher down in Florida. But talking with, I guess everybody knows Polly Sackler. She married Arnie Bennett, Arnie Bennett married her. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking with, uh, one, one on the 4th of July, Richard, we were down to the VFW. And uh, Polly introduced me to one of her sisters. So she said, we come from Lockport, New York. So I said, you know anybody named Mancini? Yeah, Harold Mancini lives right around the corner from me. I said, no. <laughs> so I got in touch with Harold, and sure enough, he, do, he knows me. He knew them. Wow. They grew up together. Mm -hmm. Funny thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Funny mm -hmm. thing in the world. Uh, I haven't kept up with any of mine, I'm sorry to say. Uh, most of my outfit they came from the Midwest. They still have a reunion every year, but it's always in the middle of the summer, like someplace like Kansas City. Or right. <laughs> <laughs> Not what you had in mind. Right here. Um, even though, I mean, I cannot begin to understand what it must have been like and how difficult it must have been like. Do you, looking back on those years now, do you feel a sense of, you know, regret that you had those experiences? Was it worthwhile for you as people? Did you, do you value those years? Yeah, I value them. The way I feel about it, I wouldn't have missed it for the world, but I wouldn't wish it on anybody else. <laughs> Well, they, they could keep that area down there in Australia, New Guinea. That area they could keep. <laughs> 110 every day on the eating for ants, snakes, oh, coconuts. I eat more coconuts. <laughs> and uh, I know my mother sent her some seeds one time. Tomatoes and peppers. Right there. 
tomatoes grew up the trees with little ones like that, a couple of that high of <laughs> And the uh, sweet potatoes, watermelon, those things grew wild over there. Oh. Papayas, all that. You could get out of there. They had about six or seven different types of bananas. Another big, big, big black chicken. I don't even want to see a banana. <laughs> <laughs> Spam, keep it. The <laughs> only <laughs> bean, which is horse meat, keep it. Uh, what else? All from Australia used to get those small cans of bacon and sausage. C rations, K rations. We used to get cigarettes. You get four cottons a month, but boy, they were just as green as grass. <laughs> well, that reminds me. Yeah. John, we're talking about the buzz bombs, and the, uh, we came across a place in Germany where they manufactured those things, and they evidently used a lot of alcohol. Maybe they, maybe they propelled them with alcohol. I don't know, but we we found that that alcohol mixed with a sea ration orange. It's <laughs> 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 a good, good drink, but you didn't want to drink too much of it. It's a friend of mine. That was done. <laughs> <laughs> a fellow by the name of Hatton, a little Irish red-headed fellow, he drank too much of it, and I never saw this in my life. I hope I never see it again. His eyes went just like that. Oh, wow. Well, I think this is a good note to end on. We're not serving you alcohol, but I do hope you'll come over and join us. And I really would like to thank the four of you so much for being here tonight. It's been great to hear your stories, and we appreciate your reliving some of it with us. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. It's been really nice to have you. And you can come browse through this memorabilia if you want. We didn't have time to really talk about it, but feel free to look around. <laughs>